This is Billy Key, welcoming you to Scotland's Black History. In a new programme next week, we'll hear accounts of slave voyages undertaken by folk from Montrose and Arbroath. The reader is Dr Michael Morris. While we remained upon this coast, the master of each room went down and called out if they were all well, and if any of them was dead, they were immediately brought up to the deck, and in the presence of all the Negroes, the dead corpse was thrown out at a gun port into the depths of the sea as the most effectual method to get clear of it. The dead body will continue to float about for a considerable time after upon the face of the water without appearing to sink. This they will often do within perhaps a few yards of the ship and many times continue until it be torn to pieces by sharks, which makes the very blood flow red upon the face of the water. And the rest of the slaves seeing this, they will often cry out. And, like Katrina de Voyle, here talking about a family friend from Sierra Leone, will question what we should do about our black history. He came into the dining room one day when I had my books in front of me and I looked up and I said, Ceci, we can't ever do anything to try and say sorry and make reparations to your country because it was the cleverest, strongest, best ones that were shipped away. I mean, what Africa would have been like without losing these cleverest, strongest, leading people, no one can imagine. For now, though, the last of the original series from 2003. Programme 6, Bringing It All Back Home. It's not a matter of me not considering myself to be Scottish. It's the fact that I don't think the Scottish people see me as Scottish. Whatever I do, I don't think they will see me as Scottish. The friendship and community here is definitely enough to make up for the few and frequent name callings and hurt that you feel, definitely. I've got some great friends here in Scotland. West Indians are seen as incomers. That's what a uh, minister of the church once called me, um, an incomer. And when I told him I was part of the setup before him, because <laughs> he's 1707 and I'm 1655, he was actually shocked that it was that long. That's the only time I'm treated as Scottish when I go outside of Scotland. It's great, it feels good. Black voices in Scotland today. Diverse voices. Cecilia Bocor is Ghanaian. Geoffrey Palmer, Jamaican. Carol Da Silva, Brazilian Scottish. While Kokumo Roxy's dad was a Nigerian Fife miner. Dramatically different backgrounds, but sharing one crucial thing the colour of their complexion. And the question mark that raises among sections of the equally diverse majority population about their basic right to belong. I went up to Stornoway and I was in a youth hostel. And I walked in and there was a Chilean woman and some Canadians, French, Spanish and Americans. And I said, oh, hello. And they went, oh, great, a native, a somebody from Scotland. And they all got really excited. And so for the next hour, I sat down and told them all about Scotland and I felt really proud. Nobody ever here assumes that I'm Scottish. You know, and it was just such a treat to just to be Scottish for a change and they just for taking it on board that there's such a thing as a black Scot. I mean, you're an, an African-American. Nobody would ever think of America. They would think it really peculiar if they thought an African-American wasn't American. But people here still ask me every day of my life, I have been asked, where do you come from? Or where do you really come from? I'm never, ever Scottish and it pisses me off. So if there's any Scots out there, I'm as Scottish as you. I like ties and mints, and I can do the Highland fling. <laughs> <laughs> Kokumo has been aware of race since she was a child at school in Cowdenbeath and Dunfermline. Racism is endemic in our society. Hard to take if you're from here. Difficult to understand if you come from a culture where it isn't such an issue. Jeff Palmer came across the case of a mixed-blood West Indian family proud of the Scottish roots who moved into a town in the Lothians. They knew that their great-grandparents had come from that area, so they wanted to live there. So they came back and bought a house there. And, of course, what they couldn't figure out, they were being stoned by their own people. 
Some people say, well, they're naive. They know what the world's like. But they were with a tremendous sort of determination to say we're not going to be put out of our homes by our own people. In the north of Glasgow, Spring Bon area, it was a daily occurrence from children, teenagers. It was all the time, you know, name calling, black, whatever. Even the children had the guts to even call you names and even come and hit you, basically, you know. I actually don't think anybody is born racist. I think it's the way we are brought up. The racism was very overt and it was just horrible. Well, I had two friends, but they were the people that nobody else would play with because they were really poor. So the three of us just teamed up. Kind of, We were like outcasts living there. In my memory, it felt like it was every day. It was a lot of things like not being picked in the gym, people actually blatantly making noises and sort of running away and going, you know, and not touching her and, and that sort of thing. And me having to take the teacher, which was really embarrassing. Because one boy was just furious that she was forcing him to dance with me and he was just calling me names. And in the end, to sort it, she just said, oh, I'll take her, you know, and it was just like, that was worse. You know, I was just wishing the ground would open up and swallow me. Liberal-minded Scots tend to dismiss racists as low-life scum. But in making these programmes, I've learned of areas of life I would never have imagined to be tainted by racism. In a Glasgow store, for example, Cecilia Bocor and her friend were shopping when they suddenly realised that security personnel had materialised from other departments to watch them. Cecilia's white friend was dismayed, insisted they leave the shop and outside tried to come to terms with what had happened. She went, does that not make you angry? And I said to her, look, each time people did something like that, if I go angry, I will be an angry person <laughs> for the rest of my life, you know, and I want to have a life, so... And then she just turned around and asked, does this happen often? And I said, oh, yes, and it happens a lot. I mean, I've been to shops where I've had security men following me from aisle to aisle and aisle to aisle. I don't know what they think, whether they think that because you're black, instinctively you're a thief. That's the kind of daily occurrence as well, apart from the name calling and all that. I mean, you're perceived, especially in the shops, as a thief. I know this, that as soon as a black person enters a shop, the CCTV camera is right on that black person. From scenes like these, old Scotia's grandeur springs. Often, racism arises from ignorance, and when people actually get to know individuals, attitudes change. Carl Angela da Silva, on growing up, is the only black girl in the small town of Darville in Ayrshire. But first, Kokumo recalls an incident when kids threw mud balls and shouted abuse at her and her brother. My brother just went up to them and said, Why don't you like us? He said something like, I'm a human being and I'm all right and uh, why don't you like us? And they stopped and I was really shocked. I've never forgotten, I was really impressed by my brother. I mean, I didn't know what spirituality was at that time, but I remember thinking that he must be special to be able to say that to them. And because they got it, because they stopped right away and wanted to be friendly. I think I'm basically just a part of the scenery here and people don't see any difference at all. And I've never experienced it in my own village where I stay. The only other place I experienced it was five miles away in another village at a local disco. It was somebody that knew who I was, but I hadn't grown up with him or known him all my life like I have the people of Darville. So he was a stranger and he was basically involved in name calling. It was, I mean, it's not nice. It's not a nice thing. It's more the tone and what's behind it, I think, that is upsetting. I was out with people from Darville and I can remember one of the guys that was there basically took the guy from Galston aside and he basically just said, I'm not happy with you speaking to a friend of mine like that and asked him to apologise, which he did. So it was diffused, but I was basically defended by people in my hometown. So that was nice. They just stated that they saw me as their friend and that was important and it was good. Historically, too, there are many instances where black people have become characters and part of the community. 
This song is The Braes of Glenifer by the Paisley weaver and poet Robert Tannehill. Almost an adopted brother to Tannehill was a fellow weaver, Peter Burnett, born a freedman in Virginia in 1764. He became a Weald Kent Paisley buddy. Angus Calder, Polly Root and James Robertson. He married two or three times and had children by his Scottish wives and his acceptance by the community in Paisley seems to be absolute and total. And when in the late 1830s or early 40s he falls on hard times because the weaving industry is going into depression, he gets somebody to write his life into a pamphlet and the pamphlet is sold to give him some means of support. It's no, it's Back in the 1880s, there was a captain of Scotland called Andrew Watson who played for the great Queen's Park Club and Captain Scotland. I'm equally fascinated by the case of the first governor of British Columbia, James Douglas, who likewise came from Guyana. He was educated in Scotland by his white Scottish father. He went out and worked for the Hudson's Bay Company. And possibly Queen Victoria's government didn't know that they were appointing a black man to govern a large new colony. The most amazing family history that we came upon was the Tull Warnock family history because we can trace a family history from slavery in the Caribbean right to the present day in Scotland. It begins with, remarkably, a photograph of a woman called Anna Lashley Tull, who was his slave when the photograph was taken. Walter Tull was the first black footballer to be signed for Rangers. He was signed for Rangers when he was unbelievably a commissioned officer in the British Army in the First World War. Unfortunately, he never played for Rangers because he died on the Western Front in the First World War. It's unconceivable, really, that he was a commissioned officer in the British Army because the British Army had regulations against commissioning black people. He was commissioned because he was a football hero. In other branches of popular culture, music especially, blackness and Scottishness have always been cool. This is Average White Band, whose Caledonia soul was huge in the black American charts in the 70s. They inspired the song Play That Funky Music, White Boy. And other artists have celebrated our love of black music. Michael Mara's Gale's Blue, Ricky Rossi's Fergus Sings the Blues. And we now have our own black artists coming through, from Finlay Quay to Suzanne Bonner. Black Scots are no longer invisible, like the servant mentioned in the opening programme, painted out of the family portrait when it became embarrassing to have a connection with slavery. It was not always so. Professor David Hancock of the University of Michigan on a surprising facet of 18th century Scottish history. The pride that slave traders had in their work. They put slaves on their coats of arms, as does Sir Alexander Grant. They emblazoned their new china patterns with heads of slaves and Scottish daggers, the way Sir John Boyd does. They put slave pictures in entablatures in their country houses, as Richard Oswald attempted. These six Scottish slave traders gained entry into the business world and entry into the social world on the basis of their success in the slave trade. And they were very proud of that success and didn't hide from that. From the days of the abolition movement onward, though, the same families were in denial, hiding the evidence. Some went further. Others had been willfully destroyed. I know in the case of one family, in the 20th century, the Scots family did not want their grand reputation being sullied by the memory of a slave trade origin. And so two maiden aunts 
uh, I believe it was in the 19 teens, basically erased <laughs> and cut out from letter books any reference to the slave trade, which makes it difficult to calculate. It was not us. Easier to say if the evidence goes underground. But it was us, and the evidence is all around. I've already mentioned the black radical Robert Wedderburn, son of a slave girl and a Scots plantation owner. There are many more. William Davidson, son of the Attorney General of Jamaica, who took part in the attack on the British cabinet called the Cato Street Conspiracy in 1820. Davidson was eventually hanged, beheaded and buried in quicklime for his crime. When he was led away, he sang Scots wa he wi Wallace bled. Mary Seacole had a gentler existence. The Jamaican daughter of a Scottish officer and a free black woman. In her autobiography, she writes, I am a Creole and have good Scotch blood coursing through my veins. Their Scottishness apart, they also had in common the lighter coloured skin of mixed blood parentage. When Jeff Palmer came to Edinburgh, the fellow Jamaicans he came across studying here belonged to a different social background. My background from Jamaica is very poor. I got my education when I came to Britain, not in Jamaica. But they were the elite, and they're all mainly fair-skinned. And they were mainly fair-skinned because their ancestors from 200 years ago, they're the products, they're the Robert Weatherbuds. It started off where the slave children of masters would manumit. What happened after that is that because they were manumitted, they could get books and they could read and whatever, so their children became the elite. And when I came to Edinburgh, interestingly enough, in the 60s, there they were. The descendants are slave bairns freed by their masters and fathers in a douce gesture towards humanity and still affecting life today. A fascinating slice of Scottish Caribbean history. Then there's Dr June Evans' pioneering study of forestry workers from Belize and so many more untold stories. David Gauvier and Angus Calder. Why do all the historians of the, the Great Red Clyde omit to remark that in 1919 there was a very big anti-black racist riot in the Brumie Law in Glasgow. It was between Sierra Leonean sailors and white British sailors and it ended up with 30 Sierra Leonean sailors being sent back home and they took refuge, interestingly enough, in the, the Glasgow sailors' home which was put up earlier for the last car sailors, the Indian sailors. So they took refuge in that place that the Glasgow authorities had built for the sailors. What happened is still disputed, but there is no doubt that the lines of fighting in that riot were racial. Shopping trip, Tesco and Fife. A woman woke up, washed, dressed, fed the kids, the husband, the rabbit, just like every morning. She went shopping for bread, milk, cat food, just like every morning. Passers-by got in her way, buses swept right past her. Yob shouted, hey, black bitch, just like every morning. Next day, she watched television. It spoke of riots in Britain, blacks fighting white. She listened well that morning. She went shopping yet again for bread, milk, cat food. She got jostled and pushed. From the corner of her eyes, she saw the familiar pack. Hey, die, black bitch, they screamed. But things seemed different that morning. She turned. She started. Started forward. Rage rising. She shook. She choked. She stuttered. She spoke. She raised her arm. Hand made into fist. Hand met jaw. Thud. Crack. One yob landed on deck. Blood spilled. The woman walked on, smiled, collected the milk, the bread, the cat food, just like every morning. A Kokumo Rock's poem based on a painful experience, one which we as Scots have to confront. For in hearing stories that shatter our idea of ourselves, most of us automatically go into denial. Kokumo on the aftermath of being attacked in Edinburgh's Stockbridge. Everybody wanted to believe that he was drunk, he was on drugs, he was a yobo, and he wasn't any of those things. We didn't look like that. People just don't want to believe the pain or that somebody could just hate you. I mean, as somebody, when I was, like, 15, the first time I remember knowing that they hated me just because of my skin, and this guy came up and he spat in my face and he said, you're a black bee, and the look in his eyes, it was awful, you know, and it really shook me up, and I thought... Bloody hell, you know, it's horrible being black. 
I thought to myself, God, this is awful. And I've seen it a few times. I've been attacked, physical attack, when I was in Glasgow and I was chased up the road with a baseball bat and I saw that look in that guy's eyes. When you see that look, you've just got to run because they're not playing. Some people who shout abuse, you know they're just going to rush off. But if they say the N-word, then you know to run. And I think all black people know that. If they say the N-word, then they're out for you. It was funny, that day I was running away from this guy. It happened to see a young black guy come running near me. And I was trying to warn him. <laughs> and he saw what I was saying. And he ran for his life up one road. And I ran for my life up the other road. And when we got to the conference, it was a black trade drinking conference. There'd been five people stabbed that evening. And the police were supposed to come and protect because they said there'd been fascists in town. And nobody came to protect the hotels where we were staying. So they were waiting outside our hotels. So the next day, there was people coming to the conference with blood on their shirt and being attacked. So it was awful. And all the black people that come up from England said, we're never coming up to Scotland again. And we were like, yeah, we don't blame you. And yet just earlier, we'd been thinking, this is great. Being with 300 black people feels really safe and relaxed. And I thought, this is fantastic. I'd never get this, you know, being in the majority for a change. And then it just all dissolved you know, and that's how it is. You're just happily going about your life and something will happen. Somebody will say something or make a threat and there it is again. And even some old lady in the bus got up and started shouting at me, saying that I shouldn't be on the bus and black people shouldn't be here. And, and that's more shocking. And nobody else said anything on the bus and she had a big tirade. And I've had it in Morningside. They're much more racist in Morningside than anywhere else. They just stare and, and they say things. And in a cafe, I can't sit in a morning side cafe because it's just so uncomfortable. They're all looking and whispering and it's just shite, you know? So, hey, that's life as a black person in Scotland. <laughs> it's not a barrel of laughs. Immigration has ceased to be the issue which the right-wing tabloids whip up. Asylum-seeking has become the issue. Immigration under another name. The right-wing tabloids are striking racist postures, but they can't be racist anymore. But there is still that sort of niggling, hateful prejudice coming back and back and back all the time. I think that for middle-class people would be nice and smile and sweet and there'll be racist behind your back. And that's worse. And I've had the intellectual racists who are more racist than the verbal abusers. They're the worst kind, the institutional racists and the the people that make the decisions who are really racist and yet they hide behind the fact that they have an equality policy. You know, all that rubbish, it's just absolutely pathetic. And I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Scotland's having a heart attack. Scotland's having a heart attack. Scotland's having a heart attack. The Bruins, Bairns, Black. That's a skipping rhyme with more than a dash of humour on our subject. It's included in Jackie Kay's fine collection of poetry of colour. In the same book, Jackie has a poem called Pride, in which she meets or dreams of meeting an African man on a train who recognises her facial features and tells her of the Igbo people she stems from. His face had a look I've seen on a McLachlan, a MacDonald, a MacLeod. The most startling thing, pride, a quality of being certain. What I hope this series has shown is that black and white people of Scotland and the Scottish diaspora share a common history which should never be invisible or obscured, even when it's painful to recognise the truth. Rather, it should be illuminated and celebrated to make us aware of our common humanity. I'll leave you with some final thoughts on our own and our children's sense of identity as Scots of the new millennium. When they were younger, both of them used to say they were black Scots. And now that they're older, my youngest one says he's a black Scot. The other one says he's a mixed race Scot. So that's, that's how they see themselves. But they like the African and the Indian bit as well and the Irish bit for their dad. So dad shouts for Ireland, Nigeria, Cameroons, Scotland. <laughs> shouts for them all when it comes to the World Cup. I don't regard my colour as part of my identity at all because, I mean, from where I was born, Brazil, basically they say there's 39 shades in Brazil of brown alone. 
So no, it's not part of my identity, my colour. Born in Brazil, definitely, and I do see myself as Brazilian. However, I've lived 25 years out of 30 in Scotland, so I feel that it's a Scottish culture I have, it's a Scottish education I have, it's Scottish people I've been brought up with, grown up with, and it's Scottish people I've known all my life in Scotland that I've known all my life. So basically it's Brazilian by blood, but Scottish by heart, I think, is the only way I could say it. It's not a matter of me not considering myself to be Scottish. It's the fact that I don't think the Scottish people see me as Scottish. But having said that, I've got two young children. My eldest, who is eight now, sees himself as Scottish. He was born here. He's never been anywhere. But recently, I had to move, so he moved schools and he kept coming home saying to me, some of the children were asking when he was going back. And he used to ask them, where? And they used to say, where you came from? He said, well, I came from spring. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> That's quite funny, really, you know. But then it's quite sad as well because him having been born and brought up here, if he's not accepted as Scottish, then in future, I don't know, it might create some problems for him, you know. I think he would want others to see him as black Scottish. But for myself, well, I always say that I'm a daughter of the universe, so <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, I could belong anywhere. Black people faded, almost literally faded, in Scottish society. And it's only in the 20th century that we've begun to see more black faces on the streets. And that's something that we have to, as white people, really get to grips with and decide in this new Scotland with its new political setup how we're going to deal with that. Some of the strongest myths about what it is to be Scottish are about egalitarianism, the brotherhood of man, about opposing man's inhumanity to man, and that we are all Jock Thompson's parents. And I think one of the things that we have to face up to is that Scottish people have not always lived up to those aspirations, and those myths have sometimes been simply myths that they've discarded when it suits them. For my money in the 21st century, I want to see a Scotland that takes those myths so seriously that they become fact, and that people, regardless of their race, their colour, their religion, or anything else, can feel free to live their lives as they wish and that anybody living in Scotland, no matter who they are, can feel a sense of belonging here.